Thank you so much, Dwayne. It is a delight to be with you tonight. I got to tell you, I was skeptical. A, a beach community on a Friday night with perfect weather. That any of you would show up? Uh, my wife and I, for several years, lived two miles from the ocean up in Connecticut. So I do understand the fact that you probably go to the beach so often it becomes commonplace and something like this is more exciting. But I do have to admit, when we got in town, I thought, you know, we could just skip the conference and go to the beach and then show up tomorrow as if it starts tomorrow and get a beautiful evening at the beach. But we did not. So I'm delighted to be with you tonight. My wife, Adrian is in the back. Uh, everyone just calls her Ad because it's not Adrian, and she doesn't like Addie, so just call her Ad. And uh, she has a number of books back there. Most of the prices on those books are better than you can get on Amazon. And uh, so I encourage you to look at those and uh, consider if they can be a help to you. Two of the books on the table are mine. Uh, the white one is entitled Every Believer Confident, and I wrote it so that ordinary Christians who don't have degrees in philosophy or science can learn to confidently engage any unbeliever they meet. And so if you have a desire uh, to reach the loss, if you have a desire to witness well to your friends and coworkers and neighbors and family, that book is written to take you from that desire to a level of confidence. That anyone you meet, no matter what they believe, you can engage them effectively with the gospel. So... I hope that can be a great help and benefit to you. Uh, just a little bit about myself. Here's a picture of my family. This is three years old, um, but we took this picture right after three years ago. I found out I had a brain tumor, and then a few weeks after that, uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, a mass in my stomach. And uh, I call this the death picture because everyone was saying, this could be the last time we have a family picture with Dad, but my wife doesn't like that, so don't tell her I called her that, okay? called this picture that. Uh, but there we are. On, on this side of us is my oldest daughter, Kate, and her husband, Matt, and their two boys. They now have a girl and another one on the way, so uh, we reproduce quickly in our family. Um, Kate's married. to Her husband's a pastor up above State College in Pennsylvania there, and she's a teacher. Uh, next to me is my son and his wife. They've just been married a few years, and uh, he's in seminary at Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia. And then on the other side, on the far right for you, is my daughter Kelsey and her husband, who's taller than me. So we come from a family of giants, and uh, it always was weird for me to give them a hug because I'm not used to hugging people taller than me, hugging up. That's not my usual. So they have a little girl and also now a little boy. So that's our family. Uh, my wife and I grew up in western Connecticut. Uh, we're born into unsaved homes where our parents did not know Christ. Our home lives were a wreck. Uh, we met in high school, but in our elementary years, both of our fathers had affairs and had children by other women. And so we grew up with torn up lives, families in disintegration. And uh, it was because of that, actually, that my mother, as a young mom of two kids at age 21, two kids already, she began to go on a search for the truth. And for several years, she just longed to find an answer for the, for the desire within her to, to have an answer for what life was all about. And when I was seven years old, she met a Christian who brought her to a Bible study, and she heard the gospel and was saved. Uh, Adrian's parents were on their way to divorce because of the adultery, because of the child born out of wedlock, and her dad's twin brother led him to Christ. He went back to my mother-in-law, witnessed to her. She got saved. They canceled the divorce. And when the woman who had had an affair with my father-in-law would bring the boy born from that relationship to, to drop him off at my wife's house, my mother-in-law would invite her in for coffee and share the gospel with her. Like, that's radical gospel change when you can do that. So I come to you as one uh, who did not grow up in Christianity until I was in upper elementary school, uh, but have seen the radical change the gospel brings. And uh, if you have a a story whether you were born into a Christian home or came to faith in Christ late, uh, hopefully you know that the power of the gospel. And that's what we've gathered here to do this weekend is ask the question, how do we effectively share that today? Uh, can I tell you, it's a whole lot harder now than it was 50 years ago when my mom became a Christian. When my mom became a believer, most of the people you would meet 
were liberal Protestants or Roman Catholics, at least where I grew up in Connecticut. So to share the gospel, you just needed to show them, here's what the Bible says about salvation by grace. They already believed Jesus died on the cross for their sins. They already believed the Bible was God's word. So there's no convincing there. You just had to show them that salvation was by grace through faith and not by merit and works. Well, as you know, we live in a different world today. You cannot count on anything when you talk to someone about the gospel. You can't count on the fact that they've ever been inside a church or that they believe in God. You might uh, work with or have a neighbor who's a Muslim or a Hindu or a Sikh, and, and you might think, what? what in the world am I supposed to do with them? So the goal of the first session tonight is to introduce you to the topic of apologetics, show you where it shows up in Scripture, and to give you encouragement that the rest of this weekend can be productive if we're willing to put in some effort and to learn some things, and then go forth in the confidence that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. So if you have your Bibles, take them and turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. And we want to talk about then how does every believer become confident? And I believe 1 Peter 3 indicates that um, God intends for us to be confident in sharing our faith and in engaging the unbelief that we find all around us. In the introduction to my book, I tell about the first time I ever tried putting apologetics into practice. So when I became a Christian at the age of nine, my parents began attending a gospel preaching church. They put us in a Christian school. It was wonderful. I went to a wonderful church, a wonderful school, and I was a part of my church's SWAT team. Now, not that kind of SWAT. It was soul-winning active teens. So every Wednesday between the end of school and the beginning of Wednesday night church, we would go out to the streets of West Hartford, Connecticut, very wealthy uh, part of Connecticut, and uh, we would hand out gospel tracts. And I had a great burden to show the gospel, even as a 7th and 8th grader. And so we would hand people gospel tracts and hope that they would take them, thank us, and not ask us any questions, right? Because we didn't know. We had no idea what would happen if someone asked us a question. So we quickly blurred out what I call the gospel burp. Excuse me, sir. Do you know for sure if you die today, you go to heaven? Can I tell you God loves you? We fall into sin. Jesus died on the cross for you and rose again so that you can be saved if you just believe in him and, and repent of your sins. <sighs> and it's the gospel burp because you feel better and they're offended right? You've just monologued with them this quick message, and, and the goal was, in these attempts to evangelize, the goal was to convince them to get saved right then and there, after a 30-second gospel message. And if they didn't, which they never did, we went back for more training. So I grew up with a great desire to share the gospel, but through the years, a growing frustration. And I'm thinking, this doesn't work. And yet I saw People in our church come to know Christ. I heard the testimonies, and I'm thinking, how then do I participate in this work of God to see people saved? Well, 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16, let's actually start in verse 13. Peter is writing to Christians who've been scattered by persecution, people who've lost everything, and they're facing great difficulty. And yet, even in the midst of that, he encourages them, be prepared to engage unbelievers with the gospel. So 1 Peter 3.13, now who is there to harm you if you're zealous for what is good? Are you kidding, Peter? We've been persecuted. There's lots of people out to harm us. But ultimately, Peter's saying, no one can touch you unless God gives them permission. He says, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. And here's our verse, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy always being prepared to make a defense. Some of you, your translation might say, give an answer. That's the Greek word apologia from which we get apologetics. And as we'll see in just a moment, it's a legal term so that when someone is falsely accused, you need to be prepared to give an answer to those who are saying, you're a Christian? Do you not see the evil and suffering in this world and you think there's a God that's in charge of all this? Where is he? You're, you're a Christian and you think that your way is the only way and everyone else, all the billions of people in the world, they're going to die and go to hell? That's what you believe? 
How can you trust a 2,000 year old book? Like, we live in the modern times. And these objections come faster and faster and faster. And there's literally hundreds and hundreds of objections. And yet, hopefully, I give you the confidence over this weekend to know that for every legitimate objection to the Christian faith, there are genuinely good answers that put to silence, as Peter says in 1 Peter 2.15, that put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. But here's the question is, are we prepared? Let's go a little bit further in the text. So Peter says, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason. That's the Greek word logos or logic. We ought to have good logical reasons for the hope that is in you. Yet, do it with gentleness and respect. Having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. So let's break this passage down and hopefully give you some encouragement that you too can can do this. In fact, you notice this is written not to pastors and professors. Pastors and professors should learn this stuff, but it's written to every Christian. So here's the challenge I give you today. Are you prepared to engage any unbeliever that you meet with the gospel? Are you prepared to have a conversation that leads to spiritual truth or that challenges what they believe and do it with confidence? If not, my goal this weekend is not to give you a guilt trip, but to encourage you, you can. You can be prepared, and it is exciting. I think about the different places I've uh, traveled around the world and, and even within the United States, I've had opportunities to share the gospel with a Muslim in a mosque in Philadelphia. Muslim young man for 45 minutes, he's asking about the gospel, and I'm able to share that. Now, we were on a bus in Edinburgh, Scotland about five years ago, and this uh, Scottish atheist, we had this great conversation with him. I brought some students with me to England for three weeks to study at Oxford University, and we were in Edinburgh, Scotland, and this this scientifically minded Scottish atheist is, is engaging us with the gospel. And an hour later, we're staying in a hostel with a Sikh from India. And he's curious about Jesus, wants to hear more about it. Now, I will tell you what I'm going to teach you this weekend will give you what you need to be able to do that. It doesn't mean you'll have all the answers. That's why Peter says, spend time preparing. But it does mean that you will know what to say when you get into a conversation with someone to know where to take that conversation. So let's go ahead and take a look at this then. There's a famous story Uh, known as the life-saving station. It's a parable, actually, and I want to read it to you. On a dangerous sea coast where shipwrecks often occur, there once was a crude little life-saving station. The building was just a hut, and there was only one boat, but the few devoted members kept a constant watch over the sea and with no thought for themselves went out day and night tirelessly searching for the lost. Some of those who were saved and various others in the surrounding area wanted to become associated with the life-saving station and give of their time and money and effort for the support of its work. So new boats were bought and new crews were trained, and the little life-saving station grew. Some members of the life-saving station were unhappy that the building was so crude and the furniture was so old, so they felt that a more comfortable place should be provided as the first refuge of those saved from the sea. So they replaced the emergency cots with beds and put better furniture in the large building. And now the life-saving station became a popular gathering place for its members. And they decorated it beautifully and furnished it exquisitely because they used it as sort of a club. Fewer members were now interested in going to sea on life-saving missions, so they hired lifeboat crews to do the work. The life-saving motif still prevailed in this club's decorations, and there was a miniature lifeboat in the room where the club initiations were held. About this time, a large ship was wrecked off the coast, and the hired crews brought in boatloads of cold, wet, and half-drowned people. They were dirty and sick, and the beautiful new club was in chaos. So the property committee immediately had a shower built outside the club where victims of shipwreck could be cleaned up before coming inside. At the next meeting, there was a split in the club membership. Most of the members wanted to stop the club's life-saving activities since they were unpleasant and a hindrance to the normal social life of the club. 
Other members insisted upon life-saving as their primary purpose and pointed out that they were still called a life-saving station. But they were finally voted down and told that if they wanted to save the lives of all the various kinds of people who were shipwrecked in those waters, they could begin their own life-saving station further down the coast. So they did. As the years went by, the new station experienced the same changes that had occurred in the old. It evolved into a club, and yet another life-saving station was founded. History continued to repeat itself, and if you visit that seacoast today, you'll find a number of exclusive clubs along the coast. Shipwrecks are frequent in those waters, but most of the people drown. It's a powerful parable that kind of points to the, where the church in America is when it comes to evangelism. Uh, and this is not an indictment on your church particularly. I don't know anything about your church. But for many churches, the excitement for evangelism, because evangelism was easier 50 years ago, has died down significantly. So that most churches have no concerted plan to reach the lost. And part of the problem is we've lost the skill to engage the world because the world has changed. The world is not the way it was 50 years ago, especially in the United States. And so the question is, how do we as Christians return to that motif, that idea that part of my job as a Christian, part of my privilege as a Christian, is to play a part in someone's salvation? Because the Bible says God is doing a great work of salvation in this world. And there are exciting things going on all around the world. People coming to Christ. But there is in the United States as well. But the question is, do we see ourselves as the primary focus of evangelism? Where it all depends on me. And man, if I don't get it right, this person's going to be lost. It's going to be all my fault. That's what I was taught growing up. There'll be blood on your hands for anybody you don't witness to. So my thought was growing up, if I'm around an unsaved person, I either better be witnessing to them or get out of there fast. And so for years of my life, I, I couldn't be around unbelievers. It made me nervous because I didn't have confidence to share the gospel because I thought it all depends on me. And I think what the scriptures do is tell us God is doing this great work of salvation and he says to you and me, come along, you want to be a part of it? You want to have the joy of sharing the gospel Planting the seed, watering the seed, bringing the harvest, leading them to Christ. Being the first one to open their mind to the truths of the gospel. That's what this is all about. God's doing a great work of saving in the world. And if you're a believer in Christ, he invites you to be a part of it and says, would you like to experience the joy of having your hand in someone's salvation? That's what this is all about. And the first time I learned that, it was like a great weight came off my shoulders. It's not all upon me. God's doing this work, and the people God brings across my path, this is my opportunity to have a part in their salvation. Will I participate, or will I let the opportunity go past? It's kind of like back in the late 90s, if someone said, hey, there's this great new company starting up. You should invest some money. It's called Google. It's like, how many of us wish we knew what Google would become, right? Or any other great investment. To have the joy of putting some money in and seeing it grow. This is what God calls us to do, far greater than earthly treasure. So let's go ahead and dive in then. Notice the definition of apologetics. We're on page two now of your handouts and notes. Some of you will not write down a single thing, and that's fine. Others of you, if you miss a blank, it's going to cause panic. I promise you can come up to me afterward, and I would be glad to fill in whatever blanks that you miss. But the word apologetics that's in this passage, and by the way, it's used twice in Philippians 1. It's used in the end of the book of Acts when Paul stands up to defend his ministry. And he says, I'm thankful for this opportunity to give my defense. That's the word apologetics. So it means to give an answer. It means to clear yourself of false charges. That is, of someone that's been accused of something. And that's, that's what apologetics is when someone says, well, the Bible's full of errors. That's an accusation, and God calls us then to provide a defense for the truth of Scripture, to provide a defense for the goodness of God despite the evil and suffering in the world. And so it's a legal term. It means literally to defend yourself in a court of law. 
So I don't know Dwayne that well, so most of my illustrations this weekend will be about Josh Marlowe, who was one of my seminary students 15 years ago or so. You know, when I first met Josh, I was, uh, I was in my late 30s, and here he is, this hip young student in his 20s, and he always dressed so finely. But I pull up tonight, and he's wearing a shirt that I have in my closet at home, so he's no longer on the cutting edge of fashion. I feel much better about myself. Because I used to always envy, here's a guy, now part of the problem is I'm abnormally huge, so you can't buy clothes for me generally, whereas Josh is just short enough, even though he's tall, that he can buy clothes off the rack at Eddie Bauer, where I buy all my clothes. But Let's say, for example, you wake up tomorrow morning in headline news in the newspaper, on the local news station, and on your feed, Josh Marlowe arrested for robbing 18 banks in Sussex County. Some of you would be like, yep, I could see that coming, right? <laughs> now, if Josh goes to court and he's been genuinely accused of robbing 18 banks for a grand total of $875,000, what he wants is a defense attorney who will provide a sound argument. What he doesn't want is for the defense attorney to say, Your Honor, it couldn't have been my client. He's a nice guy. He loves children. When he meets a puppy on the street, he stops to pet it. He smells the flowers. It could not have been him. Why? Because that's not a good defense. He wants the defense attorney to say, listen, your honor, couldn't have been him. This bank was robbed Sunday morning. There were a hundred and something people in the room that saw him there. Uh, the guy on the photographs on the video stills is a very obviously handsome man. So we know that it's not my client. Um, sorry, Bethann. He wants someone to present sound answers which disprove this false claim, and that's what we're doing in apologetics. We're learning answers to the most common questions. We'll talk about Sunday morning. How can there be an all-powerful, all-loving God when there's so much evil and suffering in the world? That's the number one objection to the Christian faith, and it's a tough one. Or how can we trust the Bible? That's what I'm going to talk about with the teens tomorrow night. How can I possibly believe in the Christian God when he is not for gay and lesbian and transgender people? We're going to talk about that tomorrow. False accusations, some of them wrong, some of them based on criticism of, of the truth of Christianity. We have to be prepared to deal with that, and that's what this is all about, learning to defend the truth. So apologetics briefly is the art of persuasion the art of persuasion. And the truth is, we are all good at this in certain areas, right? Some of you are foodies. You love good food and you know all the good spots in the area. And if I had known ahead of time and said to Josh, hey, connect me with someone in your church that was, that's really into food so we get the best food while we're here in Sussex County in Delaware, you would make an apology for a restaurant. That's what you do. An apology is not, I'm sorry, but this version of apology the Greek word apology, which means to, to present a case for. You would say, Mark, you got to eat here. This is grass-fed beef. They massage the cows every night before they kill them. And uh, then, they mas then they massage the steak. And they season it perfectly. The chef is, you know, trained it at uh, Cordon Bleu. You got to eat there. You would make an apology, an argument for it. And you would try to convince me. And the truth is, we all do this with the movies that we watch. The places that we go. Someone says, hey, what's the best place to go for seafood around here? If you're a seafood lover, you'll make an argument for it. And that's all that we're doing is learning the truth of the gospel, the Christian faith. And then as we encounter people, seeking to persuade them, not by twisting their arm, not by coercing them. You know, if I jacked someone up against the wall and held them there and said, listen, you need Jesus as your savior. That's not a great argument, is it? It may convince them to say the things I want them to say, but that is not going to produce salvation. Another definition for apologetics, or, or this, um, notice this here, this connection to evangelism, it's a natural part of evangelism in which objections to the gospel are overcome by means of reason and persuasion. That is, evangelism is me beginning to tell someone about Jesus, and then when they say, well, wait a second, but, but what about this. Then apologetics kicks into gear and you provide answers 
so that you can get back to sharing Jesus with them. It's one of the chapters in my book is Get Them to Jesus. When I have a conversation with an unbeliever, I want to find out what are their objections to the Christian faith. I want to try to answer several of them, and then I want to begin to tell them about Jesus because that is the ultimate question of whether they enter the, the kingdom of heaven or not. Who do you believe Jesus was? Do you believe what he says about himself, that he's the only way to God? So notice then a really good definition, the best definition is apologetics is premeditated evangelism. That is, I think ahead, what kind of questions might I be asked? Uh, for years, the two most active apologists that I knew were my wife and my son. Uh, my, my wife, because she works at the hospital in Lancaster and works with mostly unbelieving co-workers, and the subject of faith comes up all the time. In fact, for several years, she had two uh, very bright young women who would just badger her. Oh, you're a Christian. Well, what about this that happened in the news? And she just loved them. She's not a trained apologist. She's just an ordinary Christian, and she would seek to show them love and give answers. And for years, she did that, and neither one of these young ladies has come to Christ yet, but when the one had a miscarriage, she called my wife. Even though she says, I think you're crazy, I don't like Christians, when she had a problem in her life, she knew that my wife cared. My son spent the last two years of, her, of high school in public school, and then after college went to work at uh, Dow Chemical up in Pennsylvania. And every day as a, as a lab tech in their laboratories, he and others would wait around for a scientist or an engineer to give them an experiment. They'd go into the lab and run the experiment. So they sat around and talked for hours. And the truth is, it really comes down to, can we have conversations with people, get to know them as best we can relationally. Now, if you're on an elevator, you don't have time to say, so tell me your life story. You know, ding, the door's open, it's over. But to get to know people enough to anticipate what objections does this person have? What has my sister been saying lately in her rejection of Christianity? What's my coworker's biggest struggle? And I begin to study to figure out how might I answer them if this question comes up. So notice then in the text, Peter begins by saying, In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. So the starting point is this settled assurance that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life for every person. That is, it has to start with you. Are you grounded in your faith? Are you firm in your faith? Now, one of the things I've been writing about lately, you'll notice on the bottom of the pages here is my website, Apologetics for the Church. You can connect to my blog there. I'm writing a series right now on Christians who are deconstructing their faith. People who at one time claimed to be a Christian come across some objections or some material by atheists or skeptics, and they're saying, I don't know if I can believe this anymore. So I'm writing a series called 10 Reasons Why People Are Deconstructing Their Faith. And the truth is, unless you are grounded, unless you're confident in your faith, you'll never be confident to share it with anyone else. And so this is a call for us as believers to dive in deep. And as I said before, there are good answers for every legitimate challenge of the Christian faith. We live in a time we are overloaded with resources, aren't we? I keep track of apologetics books, and I would have to say there's probably 250 to 300 good apologetics books published just in the last 20 years. That doesn't even count the websites, the podcasts, the YouTube videos. It's there for us, but, but will we say, I must know my faith as best as I possibly can? Do I have the confidence that no other belief system reconciles a person to God. This is difficult. I was talking to uh, someone recently who said, I have a good friend who's a Muslim, and I just really struggle with thinking that he's not okay with God, not right with God. He's devout. He loves God. He even admires Jesus. How can I say this person doesn't know God? Well, do you believe that Jesus is the greatest need for every person? That no other object of worship is real and true? That all other pretenders to be God or to be the Savior are simply uh, charlatans? That Muhammad cannot save you? Uh, that no Hindu god or goddess can save you? Only Jesus Christ can save you. And then thirdly, that every person you meet needs the life that Jesus gives more than they need anything else in the world. You and I will sometimes meet people, it's like they have everything. 
They have everything you could ever want. They have all the money they need. They have a great marriage. They have wonderful kids. They have good health. What could they possibly need? How can I witness them about Jesus? Well, I have to be convinced that this person is lost. And they are headed toward eternity under condemnation of God's wrath. Therefore, regardless of what they have in this lifetime, they don't have the most important thing. Notice uh, then the best way to become an effective apologist is not to get a master's degree in philosophy. It helps to know a little bit of philosophy. It's not to get a degree in science or history. A little knowledge there helps. It's to know the scriptures and sound doctrine. This is where you'll notice a marked difference between what I'm going to teach this weekend and most approaches to apologetics. Most approaches to apologetics, you begin to see very quickly in the debates that you find on YouTube, all of which are very good, you start to think, my goodness, this is great. I'm glad that there's people who can do this, but I can't do that. I don't know what that term is. I don't know what that concept is. And those, are, those have their place, that academic level apologetics, it has its place. Great debates. But the truth is what Peter's teaching here is something that every one of us needs to be able to do. And you can do this because God's given his word. And one of the beliefs that we have about scripture is that it is clear in the things that are most important. The problem is not that the Bible's indecipherable, indecipherable. The problem is it takes effort to seek God. Right? All through Scripture, seek the Lord that he may be found. Well, you know this, that seeking the Lord is not like just going around looking outside on the ground that I dropped my keys. Let's say in you know, Sussex County, they recently discovered that in every uh, you know, square acre of, of land here, there's uh, 10 pounds of gold, but it's buried between 5 and 10 feet underground. Well, you can look on the surface all you want, but until you get a shovel and start digging and begin to seek for that, you'll never find it. And so the scriptures are something that God's given to us. We can know them, and as a result, we can be equipped to share the good news of Jesus. Notice, secondly, then, confidence comes from preparation. Peter says here, In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared. Now, I grew up, I loved camping. I still love camping. I don't do it very much anymore. Uh, But my, my dad was not good at camping. Because when he decided to go camping, he'd say, okay, let's go camping. Saturday morning, we go out to find the tent, and there it is from the year before, bundled in a big bundle. It had rained the year before. We packed the the tent wet, and it's in the barn where it has sat for a year. We're peeling it back, and it smells of mold and mildew. He'd say, let's go fishing, and we go looking then for the fishing rods, and they were out up against the barn, rusted. In other words, he was not a good camper. And then one day, I met genuine campers. Has anybody here a genuine love of camping? Okay. And what do good campers do? When they come home from a trip, they set up the tent in their front yard, and they sweep it out, they dry it out, they fold it carefully. They put everything in bins. First time I saw this, it blew my mind. So when they wanted to go camping, they just went into the garage and pulled down all these bins. Everything was in there. Everything was clean from the year before. And they were packed and ready to go. They just hop in the car and go. I'm like, that's possible. And here Peter is saying, our goal, our job then is to be prepared. That is to think ahead, to learn these things. So when we encounter someone who throws this objection up in our face, how can you believe in the Bible when there's so many mistakes. Hey, why isn't the Gospel of Judas and the Gospel of Thomas in the Bible? Hey, how do we know that what the the books that are there really ought to be there? Hey, if, if your God knows all things ahead of time, then why doesn't he stop some of the evil things that happen in this world? We need to be prepared to give an answer to those types of questions. And it comes from preparation, which means we need to invest some time, effort, Maybe even some money to learn answers. I have this radical idea. Can I share it with you? I think every Christian in every Christian home, I know this is really bizarre, it's radical. Every Christian, every Christian home ought to have a growing library of apologetics in their house. I know it's bizarre. Like why would it, oh, I'm a professor. Okay, that makes sense. I like books. No, the idea there is that 
many times it's, it's not because there aren't answers, it's because we don't take the time to learn them. So there's books back there. If you don't buy any, I won't be offended. Let's bring them all home, sell them at the next conference. But every one of those is a valuable resources, resource, and you don't even have to spend money today. The podcasts and websites and YouTube videos. The truth is it's not that apologetics has been tried and found wanting. It's been found difficult and left untried. In other words, this knowledge of how to interact with anyone we meet, it's been around for a long time. I think since the time of the apostles even. But even better, it's been around in the 20th century that, that we should know this stuff and we don't. I didn't know it until I learned it in seminary in my doctoral program in my late 30s. I was sitting in class one day, auditing this class on apologetics because I thought it'd be interesting. And suddenly the professor saying all these things that are blowing my mind. I'm thinking, why have I never heard this before? Like I had these deep questions about how do we know that Christianity is true and not some other religion? How do we know? And I asked these questions growing up and no one had an answer. And finally at 38, 39 years old, I'm learning it for the first time thinking, this is a crime. It's a crime that this knowledge is out there and most Christians don't know it. Because the truth is, if you come, if you stay for the second session, which I know is not a guarantee, if you leave, I'll point you out. No, I won't do that. And you come tomorrow, the truth is you should have the confidence that anyone you meet, you know where to go with the conversation. So the first couple of months that I'm learning this at 39 years old, I'm taking my first doctoral class in apologetics. And it was like, I was terrified. Like 3,000 pages of reading for the semester, so about two, three hundred pages a week, and then you had to read that and then write 20 pages of summary. And I was, oops, I was a full-time seminary professor at the time. I just found out that I had um, kidney disease and we needed a kidney transplant. I was coaching all my kids in sports, so I went to a coffee shop one day outside of Philadelphia. And I thought, all right, I got five hours, I gotta get all my homework done. And I sit down, I pile the books up, I begin reading. And about 20 minutes into my reading, this woman comes and sits down next to me. And she begins to do this. <sighs> and she kept sighing and making noises. And after a little while, I realized she wants to talk to me. And I began this dialogue in my head with the Lord, saying, Lord, I do not have time for this. I have so much homework. I'm learning how to engage unbelievers with the gospel. And I don't have time to talk to this woman. I know. I'm a slow learner. What can I say? So I, I debated with the Lord for 10 minutes. And finally, I closed my book. I put it aside. I turned to her and I said, sounds like you're having a really rough day. Oh, yes. My insurance won't cover, cover this procedure I have to have. And she went on and on and on. And I didn't really know what to say. She was a total stranger. So I said, I'm really sorry. It sounds frustrating. I'll pray for you. And her head just about came off her shoulders. And she said, what are you, some kind of religious freak? I said, no, I'm a Christian, and I believe God answers prayer. And then I began to do what we'll talk about tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning, first session is where we get into the practical, what does a conversation look like? I said, why? What, what is your religious background? She said, well, I'm an atheist. I said, okay. I said, you don't believe God exists? That's right. And then she said, well... I don't know if God exists. You know, I don't think anyone can really know. I said, oh, you're an agnostic. She goes, yes, that's what I am. And then she said, come to think of it, I kind of believe that God is everywhere and in everything. I said, oh, you're a pantheist. She goes, yes, that's what I am. And I just began asking strategic questions. What makes you think that God is everywhere and in everything? And she had to think about that. She began to give an answer. About 10 minutes later, this guy comes and sits down next to her and joins the conversation. And I thought they were together. And I said, are, do you know each other? Are you together? And they looked at each other. And he said, no, I heard what you were talking about. It sounded interesting. I wanted to jump in. So I said, what's your religious background? He said, well, I was raised in a cult. I said, ooh, tell me about that. <laughs> and I just asked questions, trying to understand what they believe, where they, you know, where they were coming from. And this conversation went on for two and a half hours. And you have to understand, all my life I'd had a burden to share the gospel with people, and I'd never had a conversation that lasted maybe five or more than five or ten minutes. Two and a half hours in, and all I'm doing is what we'll, what we'll learn this weekend, and at the end of the time, 
The guy stood up. He's like, oh, man, I got to go. I didn't mean to stay so long. And then he said this. I don't even know what I believe anymore. Everything I believe when I came in here, you took away from me. And I was able to share the gospel uh, clearly with them, able to ask them, you know, do you have a Bible at home? Go home and read the gospels. See for yourself what Jesus said about himself. Gave them my number, my email. And in every single case since that time, in 2007, they never got back to me. So I've never had anyone follow up with me, so I've learned to ask them for their email address if it's not too awkward. But that day I realized the power of this. And I'm thinking, this blows my mind. Two and a half hours conversation. These hostile unbelievers. And by the time they're done, they're thanking me and saying, I don't know where to go with my life now. I don't know what to do because I I can't believe what I used to believe. And this is what Peter is getting at here, is this realization that if we prepare, then we can encounter these people and we can make progress. I'll refer to this tomorrow morning, but in 1 Corinthians 3, Paul says, listen, all I am is a seed planter. I take the gospel wherever I go. I start conversations, and as long as that person's willing to talk to me, I'll keep talking to them, and I'm just planting seeds. He says, Apollos, another well-known preacher in the early church, comes along, he waters them. And then Paul says this, but it's God who brings the harvest. So Paul says, "All all I am is a seed planter. And that's all you and I are too. Which means that if we're willing, if we're ready, any conversation that we have with an unbeliever, we talk with them to see, can I turn this to spiritual issues? And I'll talk to them for as long as they're willing to talk to me. Because can you imagine how radically that would transform your life and this church and your church, if you're not from this church, if every member week by week, month by month, I know encounters don't happen every day, was looking as they went out into the world, going to work, going to the store, saying, Lord, bring someone into my life that is willing to have a conversation with me, and let's see where it goes. Now, if you're an extrovert like me, you're like, that's adventure, baby. (laughs) Yeah! Put me in a room full of 100 people I don't know like right now. I'm having the time of my life. I will not be able to sleep tonight because I'm enjoying this so much. And if you're an introvert in the room, you're thinking, I can't imagine anything worse, (laughs) right? And yet, I've known introverts that are amazing apologists because they're a little more choosy with who they talk to, but they start conversations, and if the person doesn't want to talk, then they go in the corner and they lick their wounds and say never again, and then the Lord gives them confidence and they do it again. But sometimes it's the introverts which are most effective because they're very in tune with the other person's feelings and whether they want to keep talking or not. But this means simply that in order for us to do this, we need to invest time and effort. We need to have a mindset of preparedness to speak the truth. That is, I need to be thinking about this. And I I stand before you today as a failed apologist. I am. I'm I'm a failed apologist in the sense that I still encounter people, have opportunities, and I pass them up. That shouldn't happen. Like, I should be the guy every time sharing the gospel so I can stand up here and tell you about it. But I give up opportunities all the time. And I have to go back and say, Lord, there was a golden opportunity. And I passed it up. Don't let me do that again. Lord, give me the confidence that I need. We need to think as I go out into the world, how can I look for an opportunity? And I need to have good reasons to believe why I believe what I believe. And they are there in Scripture. Let's move on then. Peter says at the end of verse 15, yet do it with gentleness and respect. We need to learn to treat the unbeliever with love and dignity. Part of the reason a lot of Christians are turned off from apologetics is because they see the videos where people are on the street and they shoehorn someone, they corner that person, and they begin to argue with them. I do not believe that's how God intended for us to do this. Now, sometimes conversations become argumentative. I've had very hostile, antagonistic people get in my face. You know, what about this? Well, I still need to learn to treat them with gentleness and respect. So notice, we don't start arrogant confrontations. We don't say things like, what, you're not a Christian? How could you be so stupid? No, that's not the way of Jesus. Our goal is not to win an argument. 
This is a challenge sometimes when you begin to learn this stuff and gain confidence. You begin to think, I could beat that guy in an argument. And you have to rid yourselves of that. It's not about winning an argument. If you win the argument and you turn that person off to Jesus, you've lost. If you lose the argument and then a week or a month or 10 years later, they go back and think about you, that Christian, that you had no answer for what they said, but they're thinking, but they really believed it and they were kind to me and weren't disrespectful and they didn't get antagonistic like I was to them. It's better to lose the argument and win the person. And it's a reminder that it's not about us. It's the work of the Holy Spirit in that person's life and heart. Our goal is not to show our knowledge. This is a big temptation. You know what I've learned not to do with unbelievers? Mention I'm a professor. That's a conversation killer. Or mention that I have a PhD. People then don't want to talk to me. So I, I just play it cool, and I say, Lord, don't let them ask me what I do for a living. Because here's what happens. What do you do for a living? Um, I'm, a, I'm a teacher. Oh, where do you teach? Well, I, I, I'm a college professor. Oh, that's impressive. Where do you teach? And so their view of me is way up here. Lancaster Bible College. Zoom. <laughs> Lancaster Bible, like, is, is that a real school? Is that a cult or something like that? I would rather, and thankfully, most people do not ask me what I do for a living. Why? Because if they think that you are smarter than them, or you think you're smarter than them, or you might know something that they don't know, conversation's over most of the time. So I just play it dumb. Oh, you're a Hindu. That's so interesting. Tell me about Hinduism. And this is, this is coming from a genuine heart. I know a little bit about it, but tell me what your experience has been like in that. Oh, you're Mormon. Interesting. I know a little bit about it. What? Tell me what you believe. Like, what's at the heart of your belief? Oh, you don't believe in God? How did you get there? Like, did you ever believe? Did you lose your faith? In other words, showing this holy curiosity about the person opens up the conversation. We'll talk about this tomorrow. Why? Because we love to talk about ourselves, don't we? Most of us. But you show an interest in someone, most of the time they're going to talk about themselves. Our goal then in the conversation is to lead them closer to Christ. I might bring them a long way toward Christ. I might take away some of the things that they think are impossible obstacles to believing in Christ. I might just move them one step. My attitude is, Lord, I don't know what you have for me with this person. I might just challenge them to think about God. They might shut this conversation down. Or I might wreck their belief system and leave them wondering what to believe now. But Lord, I'm willing to go as far as you want me to in the conversation. So just let me lead them closer to Christ. Let me point them to Christ. And in order to do that, then the end of this passage says in verse 16, having a good conscience. That is, I need to lead an authentic life. So my words are backed by action. See, if I'm in a coffee shop and I'm rude to someone who spills their coffee on my book, that person's not interested in talking to me. I was rude. If I'm uh, addicted to something and my coworker knows it, if I'm cheating on my wife and my coworker knows it, you think they're going to hear the gospel from me? Listen, Jesus can free you from your sin. <laughs> no way. Why doesn't he free you from yours, Christian? So we need to lead a life, and this is part of where, for some of us, we might have the knowledge, but our life is not what it ought to be. And so in order to do that, we need to have a clear conscience. And how do you have a clear conscience? is you develop and live a life of repentance and humility. The Bible tells us to humble ourselves. Stop thinking so highly of yourself. Think appropriately. You're not the scum of the earth. You're made in God's image. You're a fallen sinner. If you've been saved by grace, you're now God's child. But be humble. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians, you don't have anything that wasn't given to you, so what are you boasting about? So humble yourself and live a life when God convicts you of sin, you repent. So let me ask you a question. When was the last time the Holy Spirit brought you to repentance over some sin in your life? I've talked to people like, yeah, back in 78, I was under a lot of conviction. My friend, if it's been more than a few months since the Holy Spirit just cut your heart down, and showed you your sin and brought you to repentance to turn to Christ, you're not where you think you are spiritually. That ought to just be regular occurrence. 
You ought to come to church saying, Lord, don't, not to be beaten up, but Lord, show me my sins so I can repent and get that right. When I open the word and read in my devotions, when I listen to good Christian music, when I listen to preaching or podcasts, Lord, bring me to repent and show me my sins so I can be right with you. Like that kind of life is compelling to unbelievers who are full of guilt or on the other hand, know their life is a big hypocritical act. To meet someone that's genuine can often blow their minds and leave them open. And then finally, notice a clear conscience then prevents unbelievers from rejecting the truth because of Christian hypocrisy. Oh, sadly, one of the largest objections to the Christian faith is the idea that, well, I know a Christian, and she's a huge hypocrite. May may that never be said of us. May the unbelievers in our lives know that we are genuine people, that when we mess up, when we sin, we acknowledge it. Because they're more interested in that than seeing as someone who apparently never has any struggles, never does wrong. So this is the call that God gives us in 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16. Every one of us to always be prepared to give an answer, to make a defense, and to do it with gentleness and respect. And if we do this, you'll suddenly find opportunities opening up in your life. And you'll get to experience the joy of having a part in someone's salvation. Thank you.